Post office, you get a package, and that package has. Aren't those fun? Yeah. Are they fun? Here, pop one side. All right. Maybe you get a handful. A whole handful. Oh. Popping bubbles. I had a friend a long time ago. She, what she loved to do is whenever I would get a bad sunburn, and then two days later when your skin would peel, she would like peel that thing off. She loved that. She was weird, but you're over there popping bubbles in church, so you know, fingers going <laughs> all kinds of directions. Um, who just loves it when you've got to get somewhere and you're driving fast? And there's slow people in your way, and they move to the right lane, and then the light turns green right when you... Do you love that? Yeah. If you love chocolate, say amen. amen. If you love when the IRS sends you a refund check, say amen. amen. You like chocolate more than refunds from IRS? This is a <laughs> heck of a church here. Um, we love things that give us pleasure and comfort and satisfaction and release. But that's not what we're talking about today. That's not the love that we're talking about. It's not that God doesn't care about those things. I think God does care about chocolate and how it's grown. I think God cares about green lights and and how I act at red lights. I think that God cares about refunds and what we do with, with our money. But that's not the sense of love that comes into our world at Christmas. So, number two. Uh, anyone been to Philadelphia? What's your favorite thing about Philadelphia? Bookbinders restaurant. Didn't know that one. Liberty Bell, yeah, been rung one time. That I don't live there. That you don't live there, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good one. No, I, I, lo- I lived there for two weeks, and I just would go along the Schuylkill River all the time. If you can spell Schuylkill, then, then you are a real Northeasterner. Um, if you live in Philly and you want to watch baseball, uh, the, the Phillies are pretty bad. And if you want to watch basketball, the 76ers are abysmal. They're the worst team in the history of basketball. If you want to watch football, the Eagles, um, well, they're kind of rude fans. A few years ago, not uh, many years ago, the Santa Claus came out to, to take part in the football game, and they booed him, and then they threw snowballs at him. <laughs> Gives you an idea of uh, Philadelphia people, which is ironic because the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. We could use some of that. As much as important as it is that we love chocolate, isn't brotherly love, sisterly love, communal love, isn't that more important? Couldn't our world use more of that? Especially when families start cracking apart, especially when Santa comes to town. Uh, Towns crack apart whenever we have controversies. Our country, our political system, sometimes is in a shambles because everyone just wants to win at the expense of the other rather than finding solutions together. We could use some of that kind of love. And, And yes, we argue with our sister, and we all, we, all of us have a racist uncle, and, and we have friends who just drive us up the wall, but we've been through a lot with these people, and so we love them. We, lo- we, we love them. And there's a foundation to those relationships. We've earned this place. And all of us, if, we could, if, if you had the chance, if you could be more loving with your friends and your neighbors and, and people in the world, wouldn't you do that? Yeah. But that's not the kind of love we're talking about today either. We can talk about that kind of love all year. And God cares about that kind of love a lot and calls us to the messy work of making the world a little more just and equitable and friendly. But that's not what Christmas is about. So number three, there's a type of love that is even stronger than that. And one year, and, um, and it was give or take 11 days or so, we gathered right here to join Dell and Nancy into holy matrimony. And I said, that sacred union is rooted in the very order of creation itself, so that the height of human flourishing, the very best that we are created to be, is when God's love reflects through two people who pledge themselves together. And I say that at the beginning of every wedding that I officiate. So I'll say it again so you can hear it. So you can hear it, because most of you are just paying attention to the woman in the dress, not to me. So let me hear it to you now. <laughs> This sacred union is rooted in the very order of creation itself so that the height of human flourishing, the very best that we are created to be, is when God's love reflects through two people who pledge themselves to each other. So there's a kind of love in the world that's about pleasure. There's a kind of love in the world that's about the kind of relationship that we have. And there's a kind of love in the world about commitment and choice and perseverance and maybe eternity 
And that kind of love touches up as close as we can get to holiness. And maybe the love of a parent for a child is just as strong and powerful and interesting and, and it's, it's unconditional and it comes from the core. And in the best case, a parent would do anything for a child. Many of you have been in that situation. A parent would do anything for a child. But partner love, at its best, two people who would do anything for each other. Reciprocal and united as one. It's a love that puts the needs of each other above the needs of one's own. And our world could learn a lot from that kind of love. And God cares about that kind of love so much, maybe more than any other kind of love, but that's not what Christmas is about either. That kind of love is a symbol or approximation. It's, it's some vision of what God has in mind for the world, but not what we celebrate for Christmas. For, fourth try. Let's try the fourth one. Um, see, see, the world is made in such a way, and this has no, you don't have to believe in God a lick to take a look at how the world fits together and try to figure out what that says about what the world means. But the, um, if you do look carefully at how the world works, you might end up with this good story that sounds a lot like someone who believes in God. So, um, let's start with the smallest, weirdest stuff. We have in our world this stuff called energy. I have no idea what makes energy, but there's stuff called energy, and when it comes together in the right ways, it makes quarks and gluons and leptons and bosons and all kinds of weird things. They're barely even things. They're like, they're like, oh, wow, this is going to be exciting. Yeah, bosons and stuff. And, and those, they're barely even things. But when we stick those things together, we get atoms. And when you stick the atoms in the right way, they get fun molecules. And when you stick the molecules in the right way, you get fun chemicals. And when you stick those in the right way, you get chocolate and dollar bills and SUVs and all, all kinds of fun things like that. And when some of those molecules and chemicals and proteins all fit just in the right way, it's almost like magic. I don't know, I don't know how it No one knows how it works. All of a sudden, you get hearts and lungs that work. You get brothers and sisters and husbands and wives. And those things, when you put those things together in the best way, you get commitments. You get emotion. You get pain. You get beauty. You get life. We live in a world of remarkable stuff that fits in interesting ways to make amazing things and spectacular life and powerful values. And that's just, that's just the world. You, can, you don't have to hear that at church. That's just the world, as amazing as it is. And we have all these ideas and feelings about the world. We have ideas about how it should work at each stage of that. We have ideas on how husbands and wives should work. We have ideas on how parents and children should work. We have ideas about how pain and beauty should work. We have theories about how some of those things function. We can talk to smart people who study this stuff, and they tell us they don't really know how some of it functions. But we all know, whether we're a physicist or a trucker or a professor or a child or anything, we all know this is how I'm going to put it. Each step of creative cooperation makes something new and wonderful. Each layer of creative cooperation of the stuff of the world makes something more majestic. And whether that's just a step of making a new eggnog recipe, eggnog recipes is better than pumpkin lattes, or whether it's about putting the fire in just the right way so that you have the fire that just makes your house just right. The smell that you put in your house. Those little things that add together make something beautiful. Now, simplicity can be beautiful, sure. And we all know that in the, in the world, things do tend to fall apart. Physicists, they call it entropy. Sociologists call it conflict. But for the truth of all that, don't we also see that there is a theme in the world? There's a way of the world. There's a pattern. It's undeniable. It might even be holy a pattern that is embedded in existence itself. And we live surrounded by and infused by creative cooperation. And so our lives, if that's what we live around, aren't our lives called to build something more and something beautiful by cooperating creatively with those things around us? At least that's the case unless you believe that power rules everything. And we see a lot of people who work hard on power. They rely on that. And sometimes power is great when you have the power of knowledge. Or sometimes the power of might saves. Sometimes we rely on power and it can be the only option we have. Until power corrupts. And it corrupts absolutely. And then we rely on power until uh, it abuses. And we think power is so fundamental it's so seductive until we notice it 
degenerating our own lives and breaking down peace and breaking down hope and joy and building up walls of fear and accusation. All of us go back and forth between creative cooperation and demanding power. But all of us have the choice to decide, what is this world made of? Does the world work? Is it intended? At its best, does it work with raw strength or compassionate teamwork? Are we here as people to rule and subjugate all those things below us? Or is there a human purpose to work out harmony and peace in the slow process toward justice and goodness? Is that our purpose because the Creator made it that way? When I survey the ways of the world, it's so easy, it's so easy to see in the news and see in the world all the time when axes hit trees and leave them a dead stump and a story, power and death. It is so easy to live as though winter is cold and trees die and the night is long and we get through it as best we can because we're tough. Or when we notice how truly amazing the world can be, We see life that perseveres. We see stumps that grow into new trunks, trunks that give life to new branches and branches that offer shelter and service to neighbors. So I believe there is something elemental, universal, fundamental about the world, the whole world that moves toward harmony and renewal and growth. And if you agree with that in the least, if you're open to that possibility, that's how the world works, with creative cooperation, toward an expression of deep values, what else can you call that but love? Not chocolate love, not brotherly love, not romantic love, but cosmic, imminent, transcendent, divine love. If we see the world at every single level we can imagine, from bosons to brothers to beauty itself, if we see life as a dance that unfolds meaning and wonder, what do we call that but God? Whatever word you might want to pick, I don't know one that holds more weight than God and love. That there is a spirit through all things, connected together for the purpose of making it somehow better. And when we live out, when we decide to live out on that story, uh, that expression of a grand love in our small lives, we take part in a drama of love. And we can live better, we can live not as well, we can try to find our way to integrity, but we can aim toward that love. We can tell stories and live out traditions and rituals and remind ourselves how we matter to that story. We can tell stories with metaphors, we can tell stories about things that really happened, we can tell stories just about questions we don't know the answers to, and those can help inspire us and empower us and enact love in our lives. And this story that we prepare for We've been preparing for three weeks. The Christmas story with history and mystery and meaning. This story reminds us that God's love is not obscure. It is not distant. It is not theoretical. It is not saccharine. The world is stitched together by something real and powerful. And we can experience that so fully. We can approach it more passionately. We can love because God made a world immersed by love This is a story of God breaking into our lives to inspire and empower and enact grand love in the small places, like a little baby announced by grand angels, like a little baby that gives peace to the whole world. This is a story about a a root in the world that is so deep and wide that gives birth in a way that branches out over all that we are and all that we do. That's what we celebrate on Christmas, and that is the adventure we prepare for for the next few days. Amen.